Hi everyone, welcome back to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is our second video in flight operations. In this lesson, we are going to cover aircraft performance. First topic in aircraft performance is the effect of critical surface contamination or icing. You will notice that this topic is pretty massive. It's in red, meaning you are going to get a question or highly likely to get a question on your exam on this. It's also covered in aircraft performance, it's covered in air law, it is covered in theory of flight, and it is covered in meteorology. It shows up pretty much everywhere, and for good reason, because unfortunately aircraft have crashed when they are taking off or attempt to take off with icing on the wings or the tail. So just to go through these pictures on the left, is a relatively recent uh, picture, a few years old, an ATR-42 operated by Westwind Aviation that took off, I believe, Fond du Lac, uh, Saskatchewan. It uh, wasn't properly de-iced or not de-iced at all. After takeoff, it crashed. Uh, somewhat miraculously, most of the people survived. One person ended up succumbing to their injuries at uh, a later time in the hospital. The second one is a Fokker F-28 operated by Air Ontario. This accident is decades old and provided the impetus for all of this de-icing regulation. Uh, it used to be years ago, you could take off if you were okay with the ice. It, it looks to be reasonable. After that, they figured that there is no safe amount of snow or ice on a critical surface. It must all be removed. One of the numbers that shows up, I've seen this in like a P-STAR test, and I've seen this in a commercial pilot test, an ATPL test, and I've even seen it in manuals for airline operations, that frost can decrease lift by up to 30% and increase drag by up to 40%. Now, one of the truly dangerous things about critical surface contamination is how unpredictable it is. So let's look at these two accidents that we just talked about, Westwind Aviation and Air Ontario. My guess is this was not the first time these pilots took off with ice on the wings or snow on the wings. My guess is that they had been doing this for a career and it worked out for them every time. And it works out every time until it doesn't. Kind of like drunk driving. People that drive drunk typically have driven drunk hundreds of times before it worked out fine, they keep doing it, no big deal, I don't understand what the fuss is about until one day it gets you. And icing is the same way. So you must remove all snow or ice from critical surfaces. We'll discuss in another lesson the best way to do this depending on the temperature and the type of contamination. Let's talk about the lift drag ratio. So lift, we will learn uh, later, is the vertical force sustaining an aircraft in flight. Drag is basically what pulls you back for lack of a better term for now. And the lift drag ratio determines how well an airplane will climb for a given power, and it will determine how well it glides and how well the range is. Obviously you want a high amount of lift and a low amount of drag. A typical lift drag ratio would be eight for a Cessna 172 or up to 50 for a high performance glider. The best rate of climb and the best glide speed is the best lift drag ratio. So let's go through this diagram. On the left here, we have the coefficient of drag, and then the bottom, we have the angle of attack. The angle of attack we will learn is the angle between the wing cord and the relative airflow. On the right side, we have the lift drag ratio. Right here, this red line right here, this is your coefficient of lift line. As the angle of attack increases, your coefficient of lift, shown here, increases until the point of stall, which we will discuss later. The drag, the yellow line here, increases exponentially as angle of attack increases. The ratio of lift to drag increases in the green, up to this point here, which is called the LD max. In this case, the maximum lift drag ratio, about 12 and a half, 
which occurs at an angle of attack of about six degrees. We will discuss this lesson a bit more in meteorology, but for aircraft performance, let's talk about the effects of density altitude. Density altitude is the altitude that would be the equivalent given the temperature and pressure. So, a high density altitude is high atmospheric pressure and high temperature, and it dramatically decreases aircraft performance. The reason for this is that you have less lift because of the lower air density. The engine produces less power because there is less mass of air going into the engine. As well, you need higher air speed to take off and climb because of the lower air density. Additionally, humidity decreases airplane performance because it reduces engine power. I'd like to look at a video. There's a few videos out there which you can search on YouTube, and I'll see if I can insert it in here. There's a couple crashes that are a result of a pilot taking off in high density altitude. And what often happens, a pilot flies at low altitude. They are used to a runway that's relatively short, but let's say 2,000 feet long, and they think, oh, 2,000 feet, plenty. I get off in half that distance. And then they try a 2,000 foot elevation airport or a 2,000 foot long airstrip at a high elevation, let's say 5,000 feet, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, this plane really doesn't want to take off, and they end up in trouble. We have an equation that comes up often in aviation. It's called attitude plus power equals performance. The aircraft performance is dependent on the attitude, nose up and nose down, of the aircraft plus the power. High power and high nose up attitude will result in high performance, a high rate of climb. Likewise, a a low power setting and a nose down attitude will result in low performance. There's an approximation that every 100 RPM of power equals five knots indicated airspeed or 100 feet per minute rate of climb. It's not exact, but you'd be surprised how accurate it is. So if you're flying and uh, you don't wanna climb as much or you wanna increase your rate of descent, by let's say 200 feet a minute, just pull off 200 RPM of power and maintain the same airspeed, and you should uh, it should work out pretty close. Let's talk about some takeoffs and landings. Now this is a major part of your in-flight training, and so I'm just going to briefly go over this with you, and uh, the rest of it, how to properly uh, conduct these takeoffs and landings, will be covered by your flight instructor during your flight training. A normal takeoff is used for most takeoffs. A short field takeoff is, the intent of it is to be airborne in the least distance. You typically rotate at a minimum speed and then accelerate in ground effect. And a soft field takeoff is an airborne at the slowest speed used, let's say we take off from gravel or more likely a wet, soft grass. We wanna keep the nose off the ground as long as possible. And we want to accelerate in ground effect after taking off. Let's talk about this ground effect. So we will cover at a later time uh, that the wings produce vortices on each uh, wing, and this is a byproduct of the creation of lift. This is called induced drag. These wingtip vortices cause what are called induced drag, or are by definition induced drag. We'll cover that in your theory of flight, and they spin from bottom to top. However, when the aircraft is low to the ground, these wingtip vortices are diminished because they cannot go all the way around and they get compressed near the ground, blocked by the ground, and this causes a reduction in induced drag. It is this reduction in induced drag that is the ground effect. Ground effect is not riding on a cushion of air, as is commonly explained. It is a reduction in induced drag. Because it is a function of the height and the wingspan, a low wing aircraft has more pronounced ground effect than a high wing aircraft because the wing on touchdown will be closer to the ground. Here are some crazy contraptions, which I always think is are cool. Uh, the top one, these are called wing and ground effect. They're not designed to fly at high altitudes. They're designed to just stay in ground effect and kind of take off. The top one is a wing and ground effect developed by the Soviets. 
Uh, it looks really cool, let's be honest. I'm not sure how practical it actually was. It just looks like a bunch of bazookas at the top and engines and radar. Uh, it looks pretty Soviet, let's be honest. The second wing and ground effect below, I don't know who made this, but looks pretty cool. Probably covers uh, large water distances reasonably efficiently. The effect of ground effect is that on landing, you will tend to float and go down the runway without touching down right away. The other eff negative effect is that you will not climb out after airborne in a heavy aircraft. Let's say, like we said about high density altitude, you take off, you go on ground effect because there's not much drag, and you try to climb out of ground effect. You were able to get airborne, but you couldn't get out of ground effect, and you end up running off the end of the runway at about three feet and into the trees. Here's a video to show you just how pronounced ground effect is. And this is in a glider. Uh, and this guy goes for miles in ground effect. Uh, let's take a look. Negative. I'm uh, going to come in and land. So I'm landing on the runway. Okay, looks like you're going to show it off now. Oh, I'm just having fun in this little micro lift. But uh, I'm actually going to watch, I'm actually going to do a demonstration for uh, ground effect. Okay. Nephi area traffic, glider 85 Whiskey is on a left downwind for 3-5, Nephi. Okay, I'm going to show what uh, ground effect is like. What ground effect is, is that your wings, when they get close to the ground, um, don't have quite as much drag as they normally do. And you can just kind of seem to float above the runway forever. So, that's the goal. So I'm going to dive down and hug the, hug the runway for a while. Let's see, uh, let's see how well this works. Nephi traffic glider 85 Whiskey is turning final for 35. Landing long, Nephi. done that I would have overflown this and I would have way overflown it that was fun <laughs> that was fun I uh, wow yeah Oh my goodness, I could have kept going for miles. Fun. See ya. Angle of climb. The best angle of climb is the greatest climb and the least distance. It is obviously used for clearing an obstacle. 
and the speed is uh, just above the stall speed. It's approximately the same as the speed for best endurance, which we will talk about later. Conversely, the best rate of climb is the greatest climb in the least time. We want to get to altitude quickly. We usually climb at a best rate of climb speed if there is no obstacle. And because we talked about earlier, it's similar to the best lift drag uh, or the speed at which you have the best lift drag ratio. Uh, it is very similar to the best glide speed. Let's talk about the, the maneuvering speed. The maneuvering speed is the speed at which the airplane is flown in rough air. It is by definition the stall speed at the maximum load factor. So let's take a look here. We have indicated airspeed on the x-axis. We have load factor on the y-axis. And as you can see, we have a stall uh, here, let's say at 1G, okay? At 1G load factor, here's a regular stall speed, in this case, 65 miles per hour. As we increase the load factor, there is an exponential relationship between the stall speed and the load factor. It goes up. And here, let's say this airplane is certified for flight at maximum G at 4.4 G right here, which is the uh, a utility category. Here is the stall speed. See that right here? 135. This right here is going to be the maneuvering speed, okay? It is the speed that you will stall at your maximum load factor. Now, think for yourself briefly, what happens to the maneuvering speed as air speed, or as the weight of the aircraft decreases? Now, think about this for a moment. So first off, what happens to the stall speed as weight decreases? The stall speed will also decrease, which means that the maneuvering speed decreases. So as weight increases, maneuvering speed increases, and as weight decreases, maneuvering speed also decreases. The way we figure this out is we figure out the stall speed in at a given load factor equals the stall speed times the square root of the load factor. So in this case, our we call it VS1, our flaps up stall speed is ordinarily 65. Our max load factor is 4.4 Gs. So VS prime, I'm just gonna call it prime because I don't know what else to call it, equals the stall speed times the load factor. So 65 knots times the square root of 4.4, that equals 136 knots. The normal operating speed, the maximum is V. And O, it's called, is the maximum speed for normal operations. You would only do it in smooth air. And it is the top of the green, bottom of yellow arc. In this case here, call that 155 knots. The maximum flap speed, or VFE, is the maximum speed that flaps can be operated without structural damage. In this case, it's the top, or it's always in the top of the white arc, but in this case here, it is about 86 knots. If you want to put your flaps, extend your flaps, you have to be below 86 knots. Here are some pictures of what happens, the damage that will occur if the aircraft uh, flaps are extended above this speed. It's actually readily visible if you look here uh, underneath, you see these wrinkles here, and then right here, notice how the the, there's kind of a different angle here and here. And then right here, you look straight from the back, you see all these wrinkles. The flap wants to get pushed up, but it can't get pushed up because of this mechanism right here. And so it just buckles right there. Clearly we have a maximum gear operating speed, VLO. It's the maximum speed that the gear can be operated, extended or retracted. This speed is not on the airspeed indicator. Let's talk about gliding for range. Gliding for range means you want to fly the farthest distance for the least amount of descent. We fly at the best glide speed, so the best lift drag ratio. And this speed is similar to the best rate of climb because the best rate of climb also has the best lift drag ratio. If you have a windmilling propeller, so that means the propeller, uh, the engine has quit and it's the air that is turning the propeller. 
it will increase drag. So here is what we call the speed polar. On the x-axis, we have airspeed, and on the y-axis, rate of sink. And here is our speed polar right here. The bottom end of the speed polar is our stall speed. Our minimum drag, well, that's where we sink the least, is right here and the minimum drag. And then right here, where we do a tangent line, that's going to be your best glide speed right here, where you have a tangent on the speed polar. Let's talk about flying for range. The idea of flying for range is we want to fly the farthest distance for the least amount of fuel. And it is very similar principle to flying for best glide, best lift drag ratio, but we power is a factor as well. Generally, we want to consult our pilot operating handbook for numbers. Where is the best range? Here we have a cruise profile. Here we have a range profile. And then if we look over here, it shows us that 45% power, 84 knots, we will have a better range than we will at higher power settings, such as 55 knots. So let's say we're flying at 6,000 feet and we want to be roughly at 45% power and it's standard temperature. Well, that's right here. It's going to tell us you want to be flying at 85 knots true airspeed, 2300 RPM, and we will burn three and a half gallons per hour. That's not to say though, that there might be something that can get you even further range over here at 40% power. And we'll discuss that in a minute. Let's talk about flying for endurance. Flying for endurance means that we fly the maximum amount of time for the minimum amount of fuel. So if we wanna fly for the maximum amount of time, it means that we have to have a minimum power setting. And if we have a minimum power setting, we will also have a minimum drag. An example might be when we have to wait for an airport to open. We fly to an airport, it's closed because let's say they're doing maintenance on it or a plane has crashed or whatever. Well, we just want to power back and conserve fuel for the longest amount of time. The way to do this is to reduce the power 100 RPM until you can no longer maintain altitude. As you can see in this graph, we have velocity in the x-axis, thrust or drag, because they're essentially equal on the y-axis. We have parasite drag here and induced drag here. Notice how they go in different directions. As we have an increased speed, we have a reduction in induced drag. Parasite drag increases exponentially. We add these two together. We end up with total drag. The lowest drag right here, this would be the velocity for best endurance. You do this by reducing power 100 RPM until you can no longer maintain altitude, meaning that's the minimum power setting required to maintain altitude. This is another subject that will be covered in your flight training, and it is related to fl flying for endurance. Slow flight is the speed range between best endurance, so minimum drag, and the stall speed right here. During this low slow flight speed range, you notice that the thruster drag required has increased again because of the high induced drag. And so what you can expect is you are now powering up and you have higher power on than you did at the minimum drag speed. So you might be flying, let's say 2000 RPM here, right here, and this velocity here is 80 knots, but you might be in the slow flight speed range, same power setting, 2000 RPM, but you're actually doing here 45 knots. This area right here between minimum drag and then this is your stall speed, this is called the slow flight speed range. And we'll discuss this theory more in your training, your flight training. Slow flight can occur during a go around, a short field or soft field takeoff. The primary indications that you will see in slow flight is a slow speed, a nose high attitude, a high power setting, sluggish controls, especially the ailerons, and the stall warning activated. Let's talk about stalls. We'll talk a bit more about stalls during your theory of flight class, but in this case, let's just begin with an introductory lesson on stalls. 
aerodynamic stall occurs whenever the angle of attack of the wing exceeds the critical angle. The angle of attack, you will recall, is between the wing cord, that line from leading edge to trailing edge, that's the wing cord, that the angle between that and the relative airflow. Whenever that exceeds the critical angle, the wing is said to be stalled, at which point the airflow is no longer, longer laminar or smooth over the wing, but becomes turbulent. At this point, lift suddenly decreases and drag increases. Remember that an airplane can stall at any airspeed, any altitude, and any attitude as long as the critical angle is exceeded. To recover from a stall, you will lower the nose, add full power, and control yaw, making sure that the nose remains straight. Airspeed indicators suffer a position error, and the indicated airspeed is often lower than the true stall speed. So if you think about the pitot tube, that tube that comes out of the out of uh, the either uh, the wing, let's just say, and it's at a high angle. Not a lot of air is getting into that pitot tube, and therefore the indication in the on the airspeed indicator will be less than the true airspeed. The pilot operating handbook will give a true stall speed, but the airspeed indicator provides indicated airspeed. Sometimes during a high power stall, you may even see an airspeed indicator read zero because you are at a such high angle of attack and very little air is getting into the pitot tube and reaching the airspeed indicator. This is an important uh, topic. Well, as you climb, the indicated stall speed does not change with altitude. However, the true stall speed increases with altitude. The reason the true stall speed increases with altitude is because the air is less dense and therefore the aircraft will be producing less lift at a given airspeed. However, when we're talking about indicated airspeed, the air is less dense going into the airspeed indicator as well, and the two cancel each other out, so that indicated stall speed does not change appreciably with altitude. A spin occurs when yaw is introduced during a stall. The result is that one wing ends up becoming more stalled than the other wing. This results in the aircraft rotating about all three axes, pitch, roll, and yaw. During a spin, the airspeed is slow. We are in a stall after all. There is a high rate of descent. The airplane will not spin if it is not stalled first. As you can see in this diagram, this aircraft is in a spin to the right. You see this arrow here. The downgoing wing has a greater angle of attack than the upgoing wing. To recover from a spin, the power goes to idle, full opposite rudder, not ailerons. You want to break the stall and ease out of the dive. on the inner wing now goes down in an attempt to increase lift on the inner wing and stop the inside roll. Let's talk briefly about a spiral or a spiral dive. A spiral dive is not the same as a spin. A spiral dive is a steep descending turn with increasing airspeed, increasing angle of bank, and increasing rate of descent. If we look at this chart, during a spin, the angle of attack is high because we are stalled. The airspeed is low, again, we are stalled, and the rate of descent is high. In a spiral dive, the angle of attack is low because the airspeed is high and the rate of descent is also high. For recovery from a spiral, power is at idle. You apply full opposite aileron, and then you ease out of the dive. We let our nose get too low, like this. Do you see how if I try to lift my nose, look, G-force, all right? And we're descending, look at this. All right, see that? So now to get out of it, we go idle, we 
double our wings. Oh, we come from the dive. Okay. Ready? When you recover or when you practice spins and spirals, it is recommended that you recover a spin or a spiral by a minimum of 2,000 feet above the ground. When in a turn, a high angle of bank results in a high rate of turn and a low radius of turn, a tight turn in other words. Whereas if the airspeed is high, you end up with a low rate of turn. It takes a while to turn the aircraft around and a high radius of turn. So it's a big wide turn. Therefore, a minimum radius or a maximum rate turn will be at low airspeed and high angle of bank. This is also called a box canyon turn, a turn that you might use if you were in a, turn, uh, in a canyon and had to turn around. Let's talk about the effect of center of gravity on performance. If we re recall, the center of gravity is that vector through the aircraft through which all of gravity is assumed to act through. In other words, if we were to put the aircraft on pins at the center of gravity, the aircraft would balance. Changing the center of gravity has an effect on aircraft performance. First off, having an aft center of gravity, therefore the center of gravity is farther back, results in lower longitudinal stability, whereas having a forward center of gravity increases the stability. Also, the stall recovery with an aft center of gravity Will be more difficult. It will take more forward pressure to overcome that aft center of gravity in order to break the stall. However, somewhat paradoxically, the stall speed will be lower with an aft center of gravity. Now this is a somewhat difficult concept to understand. If you think about the wing right here, this providing a positive lift vector. In order to balance the aircraft, the tail is providing a negative lift vector. So the total amount of lift developed by the aircraft is the lift developed by the wing minus the lift developed by the tail. Or technically speaking, if we're talking about vectors, they're an addition of the vectors, but because the one vector is 180 degrees from the other, it is in effect subtracting it. But needless to say, the tail has a negative lift vector. Now let's move the center of gravity aft. What happens to the lift vector on the tail? Well, it becomes smaller. This in effect means that the net lift vector from the wing ends up becoming greater. Greater lift, lower stall speed. In addition, the top speed of the aircraft will be higher with an aft center of gravity. The reason for this, we have in effect greater lift, or we can say we need a lower angle of attack to develop the same quantity of lift. Lower angle of attack results in lower drag, means we have a higher airspeed and better fuel economy. Generally speaking, you should only rely on approved aircraft flight manual and pilot operating handbook data. You should be skeptical of unapproved information. However, it may come in handy. Sometimes you may speak with an experienced pilot, and even though you can't formally rely on the information that they give you on how an aircraft uh, operates, their tips, their know-how may come in handy. Okay, let's review. The critical surfaces of an aircraft must be clean of contamination. You can't have any frost, ice, or snow on the wings, tail, or propeller, or other lifting and control surfaces. Frost can increase drag by up to 40% and decrease lift by up to 30%. High density altitude decreases airplane performance. Ground effect is the reduction of induced drag close to the ground. There is a risk of getting airborne, but not climbing out of ground effect. The best rate of climb is the best climb in shortest amount of time. 
it is also the point where you have the best lift drag ratio with the power up. The best angle of climb is the best climb in the shortest distance. You would want to use this climb speed whenever you have to clear an obstacle. The best angle of climb speed is typically the minimum drag speed with the power on. Maneuvering speed at stall speed is the stall speed at the maximum load factor. As you increase weight, this maneuvering speed increases. There's also the speed that you want to be flying in turbulence. The best range for an aircraft and the best glide occurs at the lift, best lift drag ratio. Low flight is the speed range between best endurance speed, so minimum drag, and the stall speed. A stall occurs whenever the angle of attack exceeds the critical angle. This stall speed remains constant with altitude, the indicated stall speed, whereas the true stall speed increases with altitude. A spin occurs when there is a yaw during a stall, resulting in the downgoing wing having a higher angle of attack and therefore being more stalled than the upgoing wing. Conversely, a spiral is a high speed descending turn. The aircraft is not stalled during a spiral. An aft center of gravity increases the top speed and stall speed, decreases stability, but results in a stall that is more difficult to recover from. Let's begin some test questions. What happens to maneuvering speed as the aircraft weight increases? A, it increases, B, decreases, C, there is no change, and D depends on the load factor. So if you recall, the maneuvering speed is the stall speed multiplied by the square root of the load factor. In this case, the, max, if you, the maximum load factor is constant and the stall speed increases with weight, it means that the maneuvering speed will also increase with weight. Therefore, A is correct. Here's one of these classic questions that I told you you can expect to see. Pore frost on the wing increases drag by up to blank percent and decreases lift by up to blank percent. This is a pure memory question. The answer is 40% increase in drag, decrease of lift 30%. Ground effect is A, wingtip vortices being blocked by the ground, reducing induced drag. B, a cushion of air that the airplane rides on. We know that is not correct. There is no cushion of air. C, the effect of the engine propellers blowing air against the ground. That is not correct. D, the effect of an overloaded airplane getting stuck close to the ground. Well, yes, that can happen, but the definition of ground effect is when wingtip vortices are blocked by the ground, reducing induced drag. Therefore, A is correct. The best angle of climb. So if you recall, the best angle of climb is closer to the stall speed where there's a minimum amount of drag, and it is therefore slower than the best rate of climb. Therefore, A is correct. An aircraft flying for best range is A, flying at its best lift drag ratio. B is flying at a similar speed as its best rate of climb. C is a similar speed as its best glide speed. D, all of the above are correct. In this case, D, all of the above are correct. Best range means you have the most lift and drag, which is pretty much the same case as when you have are in a best rate of climb although you have the vector from the engine's power contributing as well. Same thing with the best glide, you are at the best lift drag ratio, but you have a vector of the nose pitching down and the forward vector of the weight of the aircraft. Might an aircraft be in slow flight on approach to landing, taking off from a soft field, during a box landing, B and C are correct. So on approach to landing, you should never actually be in slow flight. You should be at approach speed, which is typically around your best rate of climb speed or your best glide speed, approximately. However, when you take off from a soft field, remember that you're in a nose high attitude. You just got airborne, so you're in a high attitude. You are at a high power setting, but a slow speed. Same thing occurs during a box landing. You came in for an approach, you're in the flare and you are now at a slow speed and you notice, oh, there's something on the runway. I have to go around. You apply full power. You're now at a high power setting 
and nose high attitude and a slow speed. So B and C are correct. So the answer D, B and C are correct. During a spin, A, the inside wing has a higher angle of attack. B, the outside wing has a higher angle of attack. C, both wings have equal angle of attack. D, it depends if the spin is inverted or not. So if we recall in a spin, the both wings are stalled. However, the inside wing will be more stalled than the outside wing. Hence, and because it is more, we are past the critical angle, it is more stalled, it is a higher angle of attack. Therefore, A, the inside wing has a higher angle of attack is correct. This is an important question, both for your test and your flight test. How does the recovery of a spin differ from that of a spiral? So recover, recall a spin, the aircraft is stalled and needs to be recovered using the rudder. In a spiral, the aircraft is not stalled and therefore can be recovered with an aileron. If you choose to try to recover from a spin with ailerons, you are likely to just aggravate the spin more. So in a spin, the uh, you use the rudder to stop. So that would be B, rotation is in a spin is stopped using the rudder. As altitude increases, indicated airspeed increases and true stall speed remains the same. That's not correct. B, indicated stall speed decreases and true stall speed remains the is increased. That's not correct because indicated stall speed doesn't decrease. C, indicated stall speed remains the same and true stall speed remains the same. That's incorrect. D, indicated stall speed remains the same and true stall speed increases. That is correct because the air is less dense, true stall speed will increase. However, less dense air also results in less mass of air getting in the airspeed indicator. And so at higher altitudes, the airspeed, the indicated airspeed is less than the true airspeed. So those two factors cancel each other out and indicated stall speed remains the same with altitude. This is our last question, uh, aircraft performance and center of gravity. As center of gravity moves aft, stall speed increases. So right away, we know that's not true because we have more lift with an aft center of gravity. We have less tail force. And therefore, when we add the vectors together, we end up with more lift. So the stall speed will decrease the top speed will increase because we can get away with a lower angle of attack, but stall recovery is more difficult. The right, correct answer is C. That's the conclusion of this last second lesson on flight operations. Thanks so much for uh, joining me today. We'll see you on the uh, third lesson of flight operations next.